and standing can we read together in the book of Genesis Genesis we read the third chapter and I read from verse 1 from the old King James Version Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 1 now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. We start from there, and we ask our brother to pray for us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and this opportunity you've given us to gather before you to receive from your word. Father, we have come. We have expectant. Our mouths are wide open. We wait for you to fill us. King of glory, Lord of lords, your word has come forth, and you have said it must accomplish that which you have sent it forth for. And so, Father, we wait. We ask for your Holy Spirit to expound your word in our hearts, even as we listen to the vessel you have prepared for us this morning. Cause that your word will meet each one of your children at the point of need. Let your name be glorified, Father. Because we prayed with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May we be seated. Praise the Lord. There's a story I've been sharing several times with people about a, a department of the police in one of the countries that were trained specially to handle the cases of the fake currencies of that country. And in the course of their training, I think many of us, we expect that they will tell you, okay, this currency is fake, this is fake, this is fake. But their training was quite unique in that in all the duration of their training, they were not allowed to see a fake currency. And so how will you be training someone to dictate something and then you don't want the person to see that thing? But I find that very, very unique and very much interesting that what they were taught was this. They were taught every detail of a genuine currency. And the simple instruction was that any currency that falls short of this is fake. Today, we are here to look at the topic, study, under the main topic, having therefore these promises. Just like our brother told us, we have seen the promises of God, several of them. Not all have we exhausted, but I want to tell you there are indeed several of God's promises. The ones we considered last month, just as he said, I will fight for you. And he said, in this fight, I will fight for you, and I will do that by my spirit. 
But then we see God now saying, go in this thy might. And that thing was wrapped up with a scripture in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. We are elder told us, just like we had established in the course of the year, that this is a war situation we are in. It's a battle we are in. And for any that we win, you must have to fight. There are promises. Why don't we just sit and say, yes, after all, forever thy word, O Lord, in heaven is settled. Why do I need to study? Why do I need to know more? What do I even need to know? Why should I study? Are there any benefits? How can I get even into studying? So what does it mean to study? I try to look out what that means and it says it's a detailed critical inspection. It also means applying the mind to learning and understanding, especially by reading. Study also means a state of deep mental absorption. It is an attentive meditation and consideration. And this, according to the dictionary, are the noun definitions of the word study. But then there is a verb definition of it, which says that it means to think intently and at, at length as for spiritual purpose. So to study involves reading, to study involves thinking, to study involves taking time, it involves consideration, meditation, and it, 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 it's consuming. It consumes your time, it consumes your energy. And these are things that are very, very precious. These promises, if we read in the scripture, you will see how the Bible describes them. That they are precious. And I know you all agree that the promise of God truly is precious. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 tells us, Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all that defies, all that defies the body, all that defies the spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 and 4 tells us of how God has given us his very nature. And then the promises in verse 4 says they are precious. They are wonderful promises. They are great promises. And so the promises we are considering are not mean promises. In that second Corinthians, if you read chapter 6, you will see many of those promises. You will see that chapter 7 verse 1 is like a conclusion. Saying therefore, having, having these promises therefore, which is like the topic before us. Now, who is it that we study? We have seen that it is necessary to study. The choir sang a song, I want to know, I want to know more. There is no way you will get to know without studying. And so studying is a very crucial aspect of our lives. And like I asked, who is it that we study? Is it everyone that we just sit and read and study? It appears that sometimes, you know, we encourage people to read, we encourage people to study. But you of the truth, you know that there are some things that they, you can be giving all that pertains to it. And you will read and study and it will all just be jargons. And I can also tell you that the things of God can sometimes be jargons to you. Except if you are a man of the scripture as recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 
verse 12 to 14. And what does it say? The scripture says, the natural man, the carnal man. I thought the media would give out that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Says the natural man does not receive or does not understand the things of God. In fact, they are foolishness to him. As far as he's concerned, they are jargons. They are of, of, of no use. And why is that so? Because the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually understood. So if you are not a man of the spirit, if you are not one that has been saved by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, our other brother, Prof, has been going to start a series. I think it's today is on three or five. On this issue of salvation, a simple thing that its simplicity makes it complex for several people. Because it is so wonderful that people will be watching, how can such a big thing, how can such a great thing, how can just such a wonderful thing be this simple? Just believe. So the simplicity of salvation has in it complexity for several people. So for those of you that are not on the Bible study platform, please join and be following. He's breaking down those things because we don't have time to break them down here. And we never be tired because it's the crux of the matter. So for you to even be in a place that you will study, you must be one that is born again. Because if you don't have the spirit of Christ, like Romans 8, 9, you are not of his. So what's the essence of even studying him? What's the essence of studying what does not pertain to you? The promises of God, all of them, the Bible tells us, are yea and amen in Christ. So if you will enter into these promises, you must be in Christ. You must be born again. Remember the Ethiopian Enoch, while on his way from worship, from fellowship in Jerusalem. Not a small place, so a very great place of worship. And this is a man that really gave himself. He was devoted. And on his way, he was reading. Maybe he was even studying. Until the Spirit of God told one of his own, say, go that to that man. And he ran and met him in the chariot. And he asked him a simple question. Do you understand what you are reading? And the man asked in return, how can I understand? Except one explains to me. I don't know if you are here and you have been in fellowship and yet don't understand the things of God. When they are read, how do they sound to you? When you read them, how does it sound to you? Does it sound something that you can work with? <laughs> but I, I, I will tell you again that truly, the things of God sometimes can be somehow. No wonder the scripture we read says they are discerned, they are understood by the Spirit. To the extent that the spirit man, that you are born again, doesn't settle everything. Because even as a child of God, not every of his instruction makes sense. Not even every of his promise makes sense. No wonder in John chapter 2, verse 5, where Jesus was invited at the wedding in Canaan of Galilee. If not that Mary, Mother Mary, was so wise, God just used her to help those people. He told them, whatever thing he tells you to do, do it. As if she knew, of course, he knew her son. <laughs> because sincerely, what Jesus said in that place, by all human standards, doesn't make sense. People come to you and say, Oga, the wine has finished. 
Yeah, if you are saying, okay, so how many jars of wine do we need? I think that would make sense, right? Or, okay, where can we find wine? That would make sense. How much will it cost to get wine? That would make sense, isn't it? But the master said, go and feed those jars with water. And some of us, we say, ah, ah, ogre. It is wine we are talking about, not water. But they were so fortunate, they were given a hint. They were told, whatever he tells you, whether it makes sense to your senses or not, do it. And that is the word of God. How do you come to know this? Brethren, it is by study. You see, I grew up some years back thinking that God only talks to his children. As in those that have his spirit, those that are born again. No. God speaks to all. The only difference is that his presence by his spirit in the life of a man. See great things that God revealed to men. Heathen. Unbelievers. The Gentiles. In the Old Testament, do you know that, you know, these two books uh, uh, of Daniel and Revelation that many people see as a mystery that they find very difficult to even study or to understand. Do you know that the plan, as we know of the end times that was started to be exposed to man in the book of Daniel, it wasn't revealed to Daniel. It was revealed to the king when he had a dream. That was the, end, 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 the, 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 the plan, end of time's plan. But God didn't reveal to him, to Daniel. He gave it to the king. And it was a mystery to the king. It was jargon. It was foolishness. But he felt, maybe he felt that it was something serious. No wonder he called to people say, look, if you guys don't tell me this, every one of you is going to die. Because you are experts in knowing dreams and visions and all that. Yet none of them could because they had not the spirit of God. Until Daniel came on the scene who had the spirit according to them of the gods. But we know Daniel had the spirit of the living God. What about in the days of uh, Joseph? The great event of a famine and of abundance or abundance and famine. Was it revealed to Joseph? It was revealed to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh, to him, he, it was a dream that had no meaning. He couldn't understand because he had not the spirit of God until the young man Joshua came on the scene. And so if you, you, you may be here, if you are not operating in the spirit of God, I can tell you that the things of God will keep appearing as foolishness to you. And so we need to study so that we understand. You know, the word of God that we study has two parts to it. Jesus, when he was talking, he said that this, uh, this word I speak, they are spirit, they are life. Paul, when he was talking, that was Jesus in chapter 6 of John. Paul also was talking in the book of Acts and he said that, no, First Corinthians, he said that the letter kills. It is the spirit that gives life. So the word of God that we are to study has two parts. Several of us study the letters. And an unregenerated man, one that is not born again, can study the letters and know it. He can even teach it. And that's why we have professors of theology that have no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But they can teach you all of theology. We have very good church people that end up just being signboard Christians who are pointing the way to Jesus but are not going there dwelling on the letters they can expound the letters to you they can teach you the letters and i tell you you will even understand the from their teaching it is just like when pharaoh was telling joseph joseph, joseph the dream it was just like reading the letters to him so any man can actually know the letters if you have you have abc knowledge you can read and write you can read the letters just like the ethiopian eunuch he was reading the letters. But that word had not been cracked open until God sent someone to him. 
So, it is only a man that has the spirit of God by the new birth that can actually give himself to study. To study to know even the promises of God. When the angel visited Mary, Mary was amazed. Say, how can these things be? But then being a, man, a child of God, she said, let your will be done. Be it unto me according to your word. That is the submission that one who has the spirit will come to. Even when it appears not to make sense. But you must get to know that through study. When you study, great things are discovered. Even the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7. You know several of us we feel that, oh, he is God. He knows everything. But Jesus didn't just sit and say he's God, which he is. What did he do? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, the Bible says that, Then I said, that is Jesus, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. In the volume, when, it, when it, if something is said, the volume, so if, what does it imply? It's voluminous. <laughs> it's big. It's large. And Jesus said, in the volume, in the books, it is written of me. And I want to tell you also that in that same book, it is written of you. How did Jesus come to, to understand that? He understood that by studying. We remember when he was a young boy at age 12. And we were told in scripture that he went to, to the, his parents took him. He didn't go there. He was quite a young boy that was a minor that shouldn't be allowed to go out alone. So the parents took him to the temple. And there they came back without him thinking that he was amongst their family members and friends. But lo and behold... Jesus wasn't there. So they had to go and do a search. And on coming to look, to look back, where they left him, they discovered him in the temple. And what was he doing? He was studying. He was asking those professors questions. And he was also answering, studying. So Jesus did not just get into his ministry. He did not just get into what his life purpose was. And that purpose was to do the will of God. You know, when I tell people that Jesus didn't come to die, or Jesus didn't die because he wanted to die. Do you know why he died? He died because it was the will of the Father for him to die. And this is, he discovered that destiny of his in the volume through study. There is something written about you. There is something written about your health. There is something written about your finances. There is something written about your family. There is something written about your life. In fact, your whole life is written about. Why you are yet to enter into any sphere of your life is because you have not discovered it. And how will you discover it? Through study. So when Jesus established this, say in the volume of the book is written of me, I have come. You will see that it was, this is, this is a foundational statement. It's a foundational declaration. My coming to mankind, my coming on earth, Emmanuel, God with man, is to do your will, O oh God. Nothing else. He established his purpose. People that have discovered their purpose in life in the book, when they hold on to it, sometimes it's like crazy. <laughs> something, I shared something with with a, a, a brother and I told him that I don't even know how to describe the faith I'm exercising. My first child is he left for Mka on Friday for studies and I had been delaying him because I hadn't enough to maybe offset his school fees. So that day I called that brother. I told him, look, I have released this young man. I didn't even tell my wife. <laughs> because 
Maybe she may be saying that, ah, are you that careless? How will you not prepare? And I, so I didn't tell her. To me, it was like Abraham taking Isaac for slaughter. <laughs> I don't know if she actually dis he discussed it with Sarah, but I assume he didn't. So I released a young man. And so I told his brother, I said, look, I don't even know how to describe this faith. But then he told me, that is what faith is all about. When the spirit said, do it, do it. And so the young man left. To the glory of God, at least I have something that he will not be looked at anyhow when he is asked to pay. At least I can pay part of the fees. Praise the Lord. Perhaps I would have sat, just like I sat and I was thinking, say, what will I do? You know, we even started blaming him and blaming ourselves somehow. Because he had applied for Air Force Institute of Technology. All his results are, were good. His performance in the aptitude test is good. And we we're just praying. <laughs> My wife would say that we're trusting God that, yes, he has done his part. Let all that pertains to this do their part. And then people started saying that you didn't tell us. It was after they, he was denied admission that I even talk, started talking about it. And then one of my, my, my mates, who was among the last set of brigadier generals that were ordained, somebody told me, and see, the general is there. Maybe he would have been of help. I don't know, my mind was close to all this. But I say, well, God, you know, I, I have come to understand God. And I've been sharing this with my wife. There are some times that my wife will press me on something. And I don't know. I can't explain. But I will not just give attention to it. And at the end of it all, my silence or my delay, which she has never been comfortable with, comes out to be the best thing. And I come back, I tell her, see, my dear, sincerely, I don't understand. I know you were pushing me on this, but I didn't understand why I didn't. But I know it was just the spirit. And then she will say, eh, you, self, you know, but this is just it. And how do I come to know into this kind of strange faith? For me, I call it strange faith sometimes. Because even me cannot explain it. Other than that, that is what the Spirit has put in my heart. And so we are to come into this by studying. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9. If you read from verse 1, if you read up to verse 23, you will discover also that he discovered the destiny of the children of Israel. This is a destiny that was prophesied by prophet Jeremiah. But how did Daniel discover that? Through study. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Maybe we read 1 and 2. It, is, it was in the second year. Is it there? Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Okay, so I'll read on our behalf. Since we are yet to get there. Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was king, made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. How did Daniel come to discover this? By books. By reading. By studying. And when he discovered that, he didn't just sit and say, oh, okay, God said 70 years. And he went to relax. He went into prayer. I don't have time to go into that. I would have loved to touch on that. Because this whole year, we said it's a war. I remember I mentioned Ephesians 6.10, which is what we wrapped up the first month with. And you see, the scholar said that you'll be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. And it goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God. Let me just touch a little on that. That this warfare, there is an armor of God. What we are calling ourselves to, to study, is part of it. And you see, that armor, the, what did they describe it? The whole armor of who? God. It is not your armor. 
It is the armor of God. And you need to know it. You see, sometimes we create our own armor and we want God to fit into our armor. But the Bible says, no, it's not your armor. It's the armor of God. You are the one to put it. And if you don't put his armor on you, you cannot fight. In fact, he cannot fight for you. Because there will be no identity of his in you. Remember that uh, 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 David, when he was to face that mighty Goliath, Saul thought that, well, battle you should not go unprepared, undressed, and decided to give him his armor. David tried it on. He said, Oga, oh sorry, I can't battle in this because it is not his armor. God has developed an armor for you. So lay aside all your armor. David had to lay aside the armor that Saul provided for him. He said, Oga, oh I have been in this business. And this is how the Lord has clothed me. And that's why when he faced the Philistine, he said, you come to me with javelin and the sword. After he had scolded him, say, you are coming to me with stones and sticks as if I'm a dog. And David told him, but I come in the name of the Lord of the army of Israel, the armor. And so in this, you must study to know what is that armor of God. In every situation of your life, there is an armor that you must put on to fight and to overcome. And for you to get to know that, you must study. We are told that when you study, you show yourself approved. 1 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved. A workman that is not ashamed who correctly divides the word of truth. Several people are dividing the word of truth, but not all are dividing it correctly. In fact, I am realizing more and more that those that are not dividing correctly appear to be, even if they are not more, they are louder. Amen? They appear to be louder than those that are dividing it correctly. But for you to come to that correct division, what must you do? Study. When Jesus called his disciples, Mark chapter 3 verse 14 tells us, he said the first thing is that they may be with him, that they should be with him, and he may send them. What are they doing with him doing? Learning of him. Studying. Because he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, I'll do what? And then what does he go further to say? Take my yoke upon yourself and do what? Learn of me. Study. Take my yoke upon yourself and study. Understudy me. Learn me. Learn my lifestyle. Learn how I behave. Learn my character. And then what will happen when you do that? There is something you will find. Nobody has opened that scripture. You will find rest unto your soul. Jesus said, come, I will give you rest. Jesus said, do something else. You will do what? Find rest. If those rests are to be weighed, between the first and the second rest, which one is mightier? Which one is mightier? The second one is mightier. Do you know how to understand by the first rest? Rest from poverty. Rest from sicknesses. Rest from uh, persecution. Rest from physical rest. Which is also important. You know, it's just like those ten lepers that were healed. You remember one came back. Jesus asked, were there not nine that were cleansed? And what did he tell the one that came? You have been healed. Those other nine didn't have leprosy, but he told this one, you have been healed. That is the same rest. He, was, he received healing inside, not just physical. So there is a rest unto your soul. And Jesus is saying that for you to find that rest, you must come, sit at my feet, and learn of me. It is not just a rest that, you know, you, 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 the, the rest that several of us are getting are just childish rest. All this biscuit, daddy, give me biscuit. Give me this, give me this. Such that mommy sometimes will say, well, I take. And you feel that, oh, you have satisfied yourself. Not knowing that mommy or daddy has just dismissed you so that you stop pestering him. He, she will attend to more uh, uh, precious things. Some of us are do so, that's childish. All we want is give, 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 give. 
how will you grow? It is by study. No wonder the scripture tells us not to neglect the coming together of our fellowship. Hebrews 10, 25. Because it is in coming together that we will study. But can you just come? Yes, just come. But come with an attitude. What are you coming to study? You're studying the word of God. For you to study, when I was discussing this, my second boy there, when we were walking down here, we were discussing something. I was asking him, who is handling the instruments down there? Where he we, we reside. He said he was trying to bring up one young man, but he said that the young man is like he's not cut out for, for this. I told him nobody is not cut out for anything. In every one of us, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where he says in the house there are vessels. He says anyone that purchases himself of the letter is fit for every good work. Which means in every one of us seated here, there is a potential for God to do anything for him. And I will tell you that anything sometimes is a calling that is like a gift that you know. But sometimes it is a, a temporal calling kind of that you are the child of God that is there at the moment and God needs his child and you are there and he uses you. But some of us fail God because we have not, you know, done something before. When he's calling us to do it, fear grips us and we, we let go. So I was saying that it is not just about ha having that in built in you and you knowing it. It is first about having a desire. And that desire can be created. Look at the scripture we read in Genesis. The devil knows that the whole world is ruled by the word of God. And so when he came to the serpent, what did he do? He asked her a question pertaining the word of God. You know that the creation story is all God says. God said, God said, let there be this. Everything is created by the word. And the devil knows that. And so when he comes to a situation, what does he do? He knows that there is nothing. And I keep saying that the devil has nothing. Everything of the devil is a counterfeit of the Lord. The devil has nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know, people look at some things like this mark. They say 666, the mark of the devil. And so people see. But you know that he copied that from God. In the book of Ezekiel, when God sent his angel to destroy a city, he said, before you destroy it, mark everyone on their foreheads that weeps. Because of the abomination in the land. So the devil didn't just come up with this. Everything the devil does is a copycat of what God does. But how does he do? He doesn't copy it perfectly. He copies with either an addition or subtraction. That has been his trick right from the garden till tomorrow. Because he has nothing. And so when I tell people that the greatest weapon of God is the word of his word. The greatest weapon of the devil is equally what? The word of God. That may sound strange to you, but that's the truth. And so when he came, he didn't bring any new thing to Mama Eve. He simply twisted the word of God and he succeeded. It's the same thing he's doing. So remember that story I told you about those Canadian, uh, those uh, police that were trained to detect fake currency? Sometimes some of us want to study the devil. <laughs> well, I don't know how much you can achieve in that. But there is a better thing to exert your energy on. And what is that? Study to know God. Study to know God. And anything that falls short of his standard, we say stands firm, is fake. No matter how high sounding it is, no matter how sweet it is, studying like we say in that verbia divination, it takes time. Moses, in, in Exodus chapter 38, I think 33 verse 18, he desired something of the Lord. He said God should show him his glory. And God told him that you cannot see my face, you cannot see my glory because you will die. But guess what? In chapter 34, if we read from verse 28 to 29, God himself invited Moses to the mountain. And Moses, when he came back, his face was glittering like the sun. He had that which he had sought. God granted it. 
he showed him his glory to the to the extent that that glory was shining on his face and people could see it that is one great benefit that you will do and you will get when you sit with the lord when you study him i had i used to have a problem i told your friend my other brother say no you know something used to happen to me very young small boy elderly people will be greeting me and you know i'm someone that i like respect and so they will be greeting me with so much respect and the thing that it became so i became so uncomfortable i had to go and tell him he was the most spiritual relation i had say sir see this thing is worrying me why is it that men are always greeting me elderly men would be greeting me as if i'm their elder and he simply told me they are not greeting you there is something in you they see that they are greeting that was what gave me comfort there is a glory that sometimes you carry you will not even know moses didn't know he carried this glory it was the people that pointed it to him then he now raised a veil over his face and the bible tells us till now when moses is read the veil is on the faces of people but when a man turns to the lord the veil is lifted i think that's first or second corinthians 3 18. study spend time with the god with god he will rob himself on you you will get to know him but like i was saying before you can really study you must cherish this word of his Philippians 2.13, God says he's the one that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And that's exactly what God is doing now. I don't know how much work he's working on you. I don't know how much he has succeeded at that. For a man like Job, that Job, God succeeded in Job chapter 23 verse 12, you will read Job saying that, I desire your word more than my necessary food. Can I have that scripture please? Job chapter 23 verse 12. You must come to the point of loving this word, desiring it, even loving this promise. He says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I came to understand necessary food, not the type that we eat. You know, most of all eat just for out of gluttony. I see necessary food as the food that without it you will not survive. That is my own, how I came to understand it. So that we understand what Job was saying. Because most of the food we eat is not necessary. We just keep eating chunk, 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 chunks that are not necessary. But here is a man desiring the word of God more than his necessary food. And until you must come to that stage for you to desire this word of God, you will not be able to study it. David in Psalm 119 verse 103 also said something close to that about the sweetness of the word of god how that it is sweeter than honey and until you start seeing it this way you will not study it and so god is calling you that these great promises what we have been doing here most times we have been reading the letters when you come and sit down you crack that knock through study that is when you will get the cocoa of the matter and that is why we dedicate Mondays. Tomorrow again, we'll be coming here. I don't know if you will be here. I don't know if you will join us online. But that is very important. For you to enter into these promises, they just don't come by mere deceit. The devil will not just fold his hands and allow you to enter into these promises. You must fight. You must do battle. And the best way is coming to know what is the battle strategy of God. What is the instruction of God in this battle? What is his word saying? That is all that matters. His word, once spoken, settles everything. Are you a student of the word of God? Do you study? Do you want to enter into his promises? If that is your desire, let us pray. Check your heart. Check your heart. Can you really say that you have a longing for this word? That you want to know him? Like the choir sang, is that a sincere desire? Or it is just lip service? It must go beyond lip service. It must go beyond the letters. So think in your heart, how have you cherished this word? How much does it mean to you? When it comes to between the word and something else, between studying it and something else, what choice do you make? Is it the will of God for you to study? 
Is he creating that in your heart? If he has succeeded at that, you can make a commitment to him by saying, Lord, these great precious promises are mine. And I have discovered that I must come to learn them and get into them through study. So, Lord, I give myself to study. Tell him you have answered his invitation by Jesus that you come. Come first to receive of his spirit. You know yourself. If his spirit is not in you, you know it. You can, as we are talking, say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I open out my heart to you. Come into me and make me a spirit being. Make me a child of God so that I will understand as I study the things of God. You cannot just know it. It must come through study. Heavenly Father, we come to you. As every heart lifts up to you, those, O oh Lord, that are crying unto you to have that spirit, you say you will not despise. Thank you, O oh God, that for everyone that has placed their faith in you, you have received. Father, some of us have been reading and studying indeed, but these things were like foolishness to us, hard to comprehend because they are spiritually descent. Today, Lord, as we all unite our hearts, we enter into this spirit discernment. And Lord, we give ourselves to study the more. Lord, let us help us to be like the people of Berea that you commanded to be more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they studied even after Paul preached. Father, even today, help us, O oh Lord, that as we go, we will yet go over these things. And that, Lord, again tomorrow you will come bring us and we will go over them again. Father, Lord, so that we come to understand the necessity, the necessity of standing under your feet. Father, in this life of battle, of war, you have given us your armor, hidden in your word. Father, as we spend time with your word, may that knock be open that we will receive the spirit word which is life father we thank you we cannot thank you enough we say lord be glorified and may your spirit deal with us more as it pleases you take all the glory O oh lord with thanksgiving we pray with humility of hearts in jesus precious name amen Lord, prepare me.